Well, this month we're happy to have polling expert Carlin Bowman with us to give us insight into the attitude and demographics of millennials and what that means for the future. Carlin is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute who's been at AEI for, do you mind? 37 years. How's that for not being a job hopper? <laughs> She was managing editor of Public Opinion Magazine until 1990. From 90 to 95, she was editor of the American Enterprise. Today, she compiles and analyzes American public opinion using available polling data on a variety of subjects, including the economy, taxes, the state of workers in America, the environment and global warming, NAFTA and free trade, the war in Iraq, and women's attitudes. In addition, she studied and spoken about the evolution of American politics because of key demographic and geographic changes. In 2014, she co-authored an e-book on attitudes about the 2008 financial crash and Wall Street. And in 2015, she published another e-book on views of the American dream. She's often lectured on the role of think tanks in the United States and writes a weekly column for Forbes.com. I asked her what her hobbies were. We're both workaholics, but she likes music and gardening. We always learn good new things from you, Carlin, and we love having you. Please join me in welcoming from the American Enterprise Institute, Carlin Bowman. Thank you very much. It's always a great pleasure to be back at Heritage and to see some friends of long standing. It's really wonderful to be here, and I, I also add my thanks to Becky for starting this lecture series so many years ago. As Michelle said, I've been at AEI for a very long time. Um, it's going to be very different for your generation in terms of the job change and job turnover. Baby boomers in my generation expected to have three jobs. The data suggests that millennials expect to have 11 to 13, so quite a big change uh, over two generations. Very significant overall. But I started at AEI, as Michelle said, by working on public opinion data, and with more and more questions raised about the polls, I actually tried to expand my portfolio, and that was a great thing about AEI, they allowed me to do that, to begin to look at political demography, which I've been doing now for about 10 years. And I've been very fortunate in branching out because I've worked with two other think tanks, and we've just finished two major reports, we're working on a third, and it is um, a report from the Center for American Progress, the Brookings Institution, and AEI called States of Change, the Demographic Evolution of the American Electorate, 1974 to 2060. And I worked with two very well-regarded demographers. Bill Fry is probably the best American demographer, Americanist, and Rui Teixeira is a sociologist at CAP. And interestingly, um, there is, I think, a lot of collaboration in the think tank world. We're not always and we, there's a great deal of competition, too, but we also work together when it's possible. And I first met Rui Teixeira when he wrote an article for Public Opinion magazine in the 1970s challenging a very left-wing perspective on non-voting. And um, since that time, we've been good friends. We've worked on this report. We agree on what the data show. We don't agree on what the data mean. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about. Um, it's hard to argue with the work that Bill Fry does at Brookings. As I said, he's, he's very highly regarded. But this has been, a, has been a very happy collaboration, and we're now doing projections looking at the electorate for the next several elections and the makeup of the eligible voter population. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today before getting to some of the things I'm looking at in terms of millennial attitudes. We identified 10 key trends that, is going to, that are going to take us to the midpoint of this century. But I'm only going to talk about a few of them today because I think I'm not, I want to talk about the ones that are most clearly related to the millennials. We now have four majority minority states in the United States. By mid-century, we will have 22. That's an extraordinary change in our population with those states representing about two-thirds of the entire population. In 1980, the population was 80% white. It's now 63% white. In 1980, Hispanics were 3% of the population. They're now 17%. Asians, the fastest growing uh, group in our population, were 2% in 1980. They're now 8%. Those two particular groups, that's extraordinary growth in a, in a fairly short period of time overall. 
the African American population is growing very slowly, and we saw some interesting changes in terms of voting patterns in, in 2016. Hispanics in particular are punching significantly below their demographic weight, and many are young and many are not citizens, but that's changing very rapidly. 58% of the overall population growth in the United States came from births, of the Hispanic population came from births here. All of those people, of course, were citizens. And they will reach 18, they will reach school age very soon, they will reach 18, they will reach voting age very soon, and that's going to um, have a significant impact on the electorate overall. Changing generational makeup is equally important, and that's another one of the things that we focused on in this overall report. In 1980, 20% of the population came from the silent generation. That's now 9%, as most of those people are passing from the scene. In 1980, a third of the population were boomers. Boomers are now 24%. Millennials are now our largest generation and our largest working generation. But soon, the post-millennial generation, and we don't have a good name for them yet, sometimes we call them the I generation or Gen X, will we'll outnumber them overall. We tend to look to the young, and particularly young people in, po in college, because they tend to lead change. They give us a sense of where we're heading. And that's what I want to talk about today in terms of, of your attitudes overall, just to give you an indication of how important this can be politically. The exit pollsters rarely ever give us a fine age break of the population. They ask four standard categories. Are you 18 to 29? And you check that piece of paper that you're handed as you leave your voting place. And we look at those people who both take the ballot and we look at those people who don't take the ballot overall because we need to know a lot about the voting population overall. And in 2000, they gave us a very fine age break. Um, very unusual to have some very small, discrete categories overall. And um, the most Democratic group in the electorate were young people. That tends to be true. But the second most Democratic-leaning group in the electorate were people over the age of 80. They'd come of age during Franklin Roosevelt's presidency. They became wedded to the Democratic Party, and they carried that identification with them as they aged. Today, we only have one distinctive generation in American politics because that FDR generation, of course, are mostly passing from the scene at this particular point. And that is those people who came of age at the end of Jimmy Carter's presidency and the beginning of Ronald Reagan's presidency, the Gen X generation, who still look more Republican than the generation that preceded or followed them. But at this point, they're the only distinctive generation. So the way that you cast your first vote and your second vote tend to be an anchor for you as you age. And that's one of the things that um, has been particularly distinctive about younger, younger voters overall. Um, just to give you some of the stats about the millennial generation, um, they are certainly the most educated generation in our history, especially our young women. And they are the generation most supportive of gay marriage and the legalization of marijuana. We tend to think of each younger generation as, as a generation that will be more socially liberal than the one preceding it. It's just the way sociology looks at generations overall. But there's one very big exception in terms of general social liberalism and that is the issue of abortion. Millennials, if anything, look slightly more conservative in some public opinion polls on the issue of abortion, or they look in, in most of the polls pretty much like the population as a whole. Again, deeply conflicted about a very an issue that's never far from the surface of our politics. Um, as you probably know, Americans in, hold contradictory thoughts in many areas, and I think abortion is perhaps um, one of the areas where I see deeper contradiction than any other. When you ask Americans, is abortion an act of murder? Pluralities or majorities consistently say yes, though that question isn't asked very often. But if you ask them whether the decision to have an abortion should be a personal choice between a woman and a doctor, large majorities say yes, it should be a personal choice. When you think about those two answers, it's murder, and it's a personal choice. Those are pretty deeply contradictory responses. Yet many Americans hold not only on the issue of abortion, but on several other really important public policy issues, these deeply contradictory thoughts. When that happens, they pull away from an issue. They don't particularly want to be involved in it. And they leave the playing field to the activists in both of the camps who don't see the gray that other people see. But this slight conservatism of the millennial generation on abortion is, is really something we've just, we've, we haven't seen for a very long time. 
And the Guttmacher Institute uh, has done a number of focus groups talking to people your age about views on the issue of abortion, and their early work seemed to suggest that many of you had seen a sonogram, a picture of your younger brother and sister, and that that's had a very profound uh, effect on attitudes overall. But for whatever reasons, that's the one issue exception in terms of the social issue constellation. Baby, excuse me, millennials are less conventionally religious. About a third of you make up something the pollsters are now calling the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-S, N-O-N-E-S. And the nuns are people with no formal re religious affiliation. That may change as you age. We tend to think of things like marriages, mortgages, and children pulling you into the voting booth and often pulling you back to church. But we're not sure that will happen with your generation overall. Most of you say you believe in God, but you just don't attend church regularly at all. So again, a distinctive feature about this generation that we'll, we'll, and we'll see how this, this plays out over time. Only 2% of you have served in the military. That's again a bigger change from earlier generations, and that's going to be shaping our thinking on many different issues overall. I recently looked at um, a new poll from The Economist and YouGov last week about whether or not we were right or wrong to be involved in wars going back to World War I. Um, and the answers were remarkably similar across generations. I was a little surprised uh, about that with a plurality of Americans having doubts about both Iraq and Afghanistan across all age groups um, overall. But that figure of 2% served in the military I think is going to be significant going forward. And then in one of my favorite polls, and I won't ask any of you about this, in Harris's 2015 polling, 47% of 18 to 35-year-olds had one or more non-visible tattoos. <laughs> All right, I won't ask about that. Um, the millennial generation is much more likelier, likely than earlier generations to call themselves independents. In Pew's cumulative polling from 2016, 48%, a near majority of 18 to 34-year-olds identified themselves as independents. 29% is Democrats, and 17% is Republicans. Again, that independent number has been going up over time. Voters under the age of 30 supported Hillary Clinton by 55 to 36%. And right now, Trump is a little bit below 36% in most polls among the millennial age group. Um, they were slightly more supportive of President Obama in 2012. 60% of millennials voted for him. Voters 45 and older supported Trump by 52 to 44. And we saw an interesting cleavage among the white and the minority population in 2012 and also once again in, in 2016. Young whites voted for Trump, 47 to 43. Young blacks, 85% for, for Hillary Clinton and Hispanics, 68%. Um, so again, a cleavage there that, that we also saw in 2012 that I'm sure will have ramifications going forward. Um, in 2015, 42.2% .2 of minor, millennials were minority, 21.7% of people 65 and older were. That's from the census data, and we're beginning to get ready to update that for the 2020 census. Um, Millennials and baby boomers both made up 31% of eligible voters in 2016. Of course, not all eligible voters, age eligible, citizenship are, are going to vote or turn out. Um, in 2016, more young voters, 9% of the millennial population than any other age group voted for someone other than one of the two major party candidates. So again, by the way, I've got all of these numbers in a handout, and so you don't need to memorize them <laughs> at all. Um, as I said, millennials have overtaken both the baby boomers as the largest living and working generation, and that too is having very significant ramifications, and the post-millennial generation will soon overtake them. What about millennial attitudes? Um, a very interesting mix. I've touched on some of the social liberalism overall, but I think the picture is a lot more complicated overall. One of the things that seems to distinguish millennials is a lack of trust and confidence in central institutions. And let me just give you a couple of examples of a, of a nuance that comes through pretty carefully in the polls overall. Um, millennials are skeptical of the federal government. I, I go back to one of the questions that Frank Luntz asked in one of his polls. He asked millennials whether or not they believed they'd ever see a UFO. And then he asked them separately whether they believed they'd ever see a Social Security check. 
And of course, more of them said they thought they'd see a UFO than thought they'd see a social security check. And again, this poll was a while ago, but you get the idea on a lot of skepticism about the federal government in Washington. But at the same time, they're not hostile to Washington. They want government to do many things. And this is true of other generations, but it's especially true of, of millennials. If you look at their attitudes toward business, you see that same uh, contradiction. Again, um, skeptical of business. Many have seen their parents or a neighbor or a friend laid off in this very deep recession, which still um, has had a powerful impact on the population as a whole. Finally, we're beginning to be a little bit more optimistic overall, but a lot of skepticism about American business, and particularly big business in general. Um, but at the same time, a lot of praise for business, a lot of very positive remarks about business. And when you ask people, what's if you want something done, is it better to turn to business or better to turn to government? Uh, people overwhelmingly, particularly the millennial generation, say it's better to turn to business to get things done in the society overall. So this complex mix of attitudes. A third of millennials are the product of divorce. And that's another central institution about which there's less trust than in the past. Gallup has been combining very, very large data sets and their new big data analytics practice. And they have looked at uh, baby boomers in terms of um, uh, attitudes generally, but also in terms of, uh, the, uh, terms of desire to marry. And you see that something you probably all know, millennials are marrying at a lot later time in their lives than earlier generations. The numbers are really quite stark in the, in the Gallup data overall. Um, again, we're talking about a very, very big generation, but you see that 59% of millennials are single or have never been married. Um, it's a very big number. That number was 38% for baby boomers at the same point in their lives. So again, an extraordinary change over time. And in one of the really interesting statistics that I'll be, I'll be fascinating to see the update when we do the 2020 census, um, the number of women who will remain childless. We look at it, women aged 40 to 44, for that particular figure has doubled since 1980 from a very small base. But again, that's going to have significant public policy ramifications um, going forward overall. So a lot of skepticism about major central institutions. Um, at the same time, um, and the skepticism about business, the skepticism about government is producing a change that I think is going to have very positive ramifications for the society as a whole. I work with one of the Democratic pollsters who um, for many years did a lot of polling for MTV. And they asked them all sorts of questions about expectations when they grow up. And one of the interesting questions they asked was, what you want to be when you grow up? A lot of pollsters ask that question. And only a few these days can afford to let people give whatever answer they want. And in the 1990s, they began seeing all the familiar responses, doctor, lawyer, teacher, nurse, and, and those are pretty familiar. But they began seeing at a statistically significant level, that's at about 5% in most of these polls, that would be statistically significant. They began seeing a lot of young people volunteer that they wanted to be small businessmen or small businesswomen. They'd never seen that response before. You don't think you can count on some of the big institutions in society, but uh, millennials seem pretty confident they can count on themselves. Um, Millennials are quite optimistic about their future. In Gallup's data, again, the question hasn't been asked recently. About two-thirds of millennials think they'll be rich. Um, but you know, whether, whether or not that will happen, they're certainly optimistic about the future. We tend to confuse, when looking at generations, the attitudes of where you are in the life cycle. So if you ask millennials how they're doing, how satisfied they are with their work and their jobs, they're pretty dissatisfied. They're more dissatisfied than a lot of other groups in the society. Not surprising. The bottom of the pay scale, the bottom of the ladder, just beginning to climb up. But the most optimistic about their prospects in society as a whole. So I think that optimism compared with um, the desire to be self-reliant in terms of one's own profession, self-reliant in terms of thinking about policy issues such as retirement income and the like, um, I think really is a kind of very positive silver lining to some of the pessimism that we see about this generation overall. Again, a complex generation uh, with many, um, many different attitudinal quirks overall, but one that I'm going to be watching very carefully as time goes forward. I thought I'd, I'd switch and maybe say just a little bit about the polls and, and some of my worries and concerns about the business that I've watched for so long. I know Heritage does a considerable amount of polling of its own, and so do a lot of other 
think tanks in Washington and on issues and on, um, we've never done that at AI because I don't want to be in the business of competing with my suppliers, with the people who provide me provide me data and allow me to look at subgroups and, and interesting questions and changes over time. But the polling business, I think, is in very, very serious trouble. But I think we are also wrong to be too reliant on data analytics going forward, which is sort of sucking the oxygen out of some of the political polling world overall. It's had a very good run, about a run of 70 years, Gallup and Roper. Um, did just extraordinary work in the 1930s, and many of those questions are still being asked today. Um, but the pollsters have a number of very serious concerns. And I think in 2016, the American Association of Public Opinion Researchers has just finished its very exhaustive postmortem on what went wrong. Um, this is a committee of both practitioners and academics, a very exhaustive and honest an analysis of what went wrong in 2016. And they pointed out that the national polls uh, record in 2016 in the final 18 days of the election were among the most accurate since 1936. No question about that. Um, the state polls had a very bad year in 2016. And the aggregators, whom we relied on so much, had an average uh, average annual output error in terms as high as 7% overall. And of course, because the aggregators, Huff Polster, Wilcoe Politics, they were in the press every single day, 538, telling us about the direction that the race was going, I think uh, has cast um, uh, some, some critical light on polling in general. They looked at a number of different explanations for what went wrong in the state polls overall. And we know one thing from the exit poll that was absolutely clear. There were a lot of late switchers in those industrial Midwestern states. A lot of people who made up their minds in the last, I can't remember now whether the exit poll question was, when, when did you make up your mind in the last 24 hours, in the last two weeks before the conventions? It's a scale question overall. And a lot of people made up their minds very late. And a disproportionate number of those late deciders voted for Donald Trump. Often late deciders split pretty evenly. But in this case, more of them voted for for Trump overall. Um, we think that in the states where the pollsters had so many problems, um, we think that they oversampled people with higher levels of education who tend to lean toward the Democratic Party, particularly postgraduates, um, and that they should have weighted their samples to have a better understanding of the proportion of those voters in the electorate overall. Interestingly, that was also what happened in Brexit and in the 2015 British election overall. So there's some similarities that we're seeing across, across polling organizations. They said the evidence for a shy Trump vote was mixed at best. And their final conclusion about the state polls was that uh, they didn't see evidence of particular bias, in part because they underestimated Democratic support in both 2008 and 2012 and overestimated Democratic support in 2016. A really exhaustive and I think very honest report about the polling business overall. The pollsters try to separate themselves from the aggregators. They, they tell us that what they're doing correctly is a snapshot in time, and what the aggregators are doing is something entirely different in terms of collecting and weighting all that data overall. But of course, we tend to think of them that way overall. And I think another big problem in this campaign was that so many Democrats brought, bought into um, part of what I've been discussing in terms of changing demographics. They bought into the idea of the rising American electorate, um, a phrase that I believe Stan Greenberg, the Democratic pollster, who, who interestingly, I think, did some of the most incisive work on the Reagan Democrats in 1980, the Macomb County Democrats. Um, he also has done an enormous work on the rising American electorate, minorities, millennials, and single women whom they see as the key to Democratic victory going forward. But there was so much emphasis on that in the Clinton campaign that I believe that they sort of misread the numbers. Demography does favor the Democrats in the long run overall if present trends continue. Geography still favors the Republicans. And so you, you see that sort of dichotomy playing out. But that, that emphasis on the rising American electorate, um, by the way, Stan has added a fourth group to the rising American electorate, the Democratic electorate that he sees coming down the pike, and that is the nuns, the group I referred to either, people with no religious affiliation, who he also believes will provide ballast to the Democrats, um, the Democrats overall going forward. 
So I think a lot of the criticisms of the polls are justified. Two organizations, Gallup and Pew in particular, are very attentive to methodological issues and concerns about the business. Um, and I think people from both of those organizations served on the American Association of Public Opinion Research Committee, analyzing what went wrong and what went right. And, and Pew has looked at response rates over time. And again, this gives all of us in the polling business a lot of concern. Response rates for a well-designed survey, a survey in, in the field, fielded by Pew or Gallup or any of the major pollsters, are now 9%. We're not sure that we can create a sample that looks like America um, with response rates at 9%. The extraordinary work that Pew has done going back and re-interviewing, offering to pay people who didn't want to participate in a survey at some of the kinds of things they do to try to understand whether or not the views of the non-respondents are different from the views of the respondents. And the evidence doesn't seem to suggest on major demographic characteristics that those people who respond and those people who don't respond are not particularly particularly different. Interestingly, in 2016, the um, polls done by people like Rasmussen had a pretty good track record overall. It wasn't this the first time that robo robo polls have done well in an election campaign, but they also did well once again in this last campaign. So a lot of soul searching going on in this profession overall. Um, I have other concerns than the ones that have been identified um, affecting methodology and, and outcomes because I think the pollsters have in some ways lost their soul. Many of them today have major media partners and it seems to me that once upon a time the pollsters charted their own course and now they're charting, they're following the media's ever moving search path. They're looking at the latest scandal. They're looking at one of the major pollsters asks, and I mean, I guess I'm not quite sure who she is, has been asking regularly who Hope Hicks is. I mean, beats me, but I can't imagine many Americans know who she is at this particular point. So they're pushing the survey instrument far beyond where it can go. But what really concerns me about the business, what Gallup and Elmo Roper in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, when they were really the only game in town at that particular point with a couple of other pollsters, working with them at that early time, they were deeply concerned about ordinary life, um, about how Americans lived their lives. Had they spent a night in jail? Had they bought a lottery ticket? Had they flown a 1,000 miles from home? Do they have a family dinner? Those are the kinds of things that I'm really eager to know about the society. And most of those questions are being dropped in favor of questions um, about uh, President Trump, about uh, the, the Russia investigation and the like. So. I'm, I'm concerned about the polling business for other reasons, and um, I think that um, going forward, um, the pollsters will, will have a lot to answer for in terms of concerns in the public about the credibility of this business. Um, every election year, uh, Pew goes back into the field after the election and asks about a lot of different aspects of performance, and they're asked about how the polls perform. And um, I think the A-B grade this time uh, was about half what it was in 1988 when, when uh, the pollsters first asked that question overall. In a poll that just came out yesterday, um, people had as much trust and confidence in Donald Trump as they had in the polls. Uh, about 35% overall had a great deal of quite a lot of trust. Um, just as a point of comparison, 60% had a lot of confidence in the court. 60% had a lot of confidence in the intelligence agencies. The only things that ranked below um, Trump and the pollsters uh, were the Congress and uh, the media. Um, so again, you get a sense of how the, public, how the public sees the landscape overall. Let me just say a few final words about views about uh, President Trump, um, uh, because certainly the pollsters are asking a lot of questions about President Trump. Um, he is at this point holding his base. Um, that base is about 38 to 40 percent of the electorate overall. That's not bad. I mean, at this point, you're close to being halfway there in terms of elections. Um, this is the peak recruiting time for both Democrats and Republicans as they try to persuade, as someone like Ann Stone would certainly know, try to persuade people to run in those 2018 gubernatorial, senatorial, and congressional elections overall. And you're seeing that the Democrats right now have a plethora of candidates in many of these races. Someone told me that Barbara Comstock in 
Virginia. Virginia has now eight or nine different Demo possible Democratic opponents in that race overall. So there's a lot of excitement, a lot of interest in the Democratic side overall. Um, people don't like Trump's tweets. I'm sure you've heard that before. They don't like his behavior. They think he's boorish uh, in many ways. But my sense of that is that it may already be sort of baked into the cake in terms of public opinion. Where he is strong, to the extent he's strong, and the numbers are pretty grim in a lot of areas overall for the president, he's still got a lead on handling the economy. Um, for all the conservative critics of the jawboning that he did with Carrier and the like, Americans want this president to create jobs. That's the most important thing that he can do, he can do for them. And he's still doing pretty well on that score because I don't think that people expected uh, the president to turn things around automatically. They're giving him more time. But overall, again, the numbers of Republicans, he's holding about 80 to 83 percent of Republicans at this point. If that number goes below 80 percent, then I think there are enormous worries for Republicans and conservatives going forward. And he's pretty close to that right now. It's about 83, 84 in terms of the most recent polls, the, one, the ones that have come out, and nearly every poll that's been taken about the congressional elections, which I don't think are worth the paper they're printed on at this particular point. The Democrats have a very substantial, larger than usual lead in terms of if the election were held today, for whom would you vote? A question that Gallup asked for the first time in 1937. Um, again, some real warning signs, I think, for the Trump presidency going forward. and few strengths at this point overall. People certainly like some members of the cabinet. They're very happy with the military team that he's assembled overall. But in terms of personal behavior, um, again, the verdict was okay more than once. So why don't I stop there? I've covered an enormous amount of ground. And I, I promise I've brought all of my numbers in the handout. And thank you very much uh, for that introduction. <laughs> Do millennials still believe that the American dream is attainable? And how would they define the American dream? The mistake that many people in the, in the polling world, and, and um, I think politicians, in talking about the American dream is that the American dream is defined very personally. Each of us have our own view about what the American dream should be. So to draw sort of broad conclusions about it, I think, is usually difficult. But again, because millennials are the most optimistic about their prospects, they still believe in the American dream. They think it's much harder to attain, will be, that it's harder to attain for their parents. Uh, it'll be harder, excuse me, it'll be harder for attain for them than it was for their parents, and it'll be much harder to attain going forward. But they still are somewhat optimistic on that front. But again, they define it very personally. And I'm always astonished when I look at income breaks on questions about the American dream, and when I look at them, education breaks. Um, an awful lot of people in, let's say, the lowest income quintile feel they've already reached the American dream, again, because they define it personally. And I think a lot of the way that they define it is through family, neighborhood, community, and not through public policy issues overall. There is a growing recognition that income inequality in the United States um, is growing, that the gap is getting wider. Sarah started asking a question in 1972, are the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer? And at that point, about 75% of us said, yes, that was the case. And now that's about 80, 82, 83% overall. So the belief that inequality is growing, in the abstract, we want government to do something about that. But in the abstract, we want government to do a lot about many things. But if you then begin to give, and the pollsters have actually done some fairly sophisticated work on this overall. Um, if you ask them, for example, do you want government to be involved, um, and I can't remember quite what the great trade-off that Bloomberg asks in its particular question that they've asked three times, but they, they ask whether or not government's essentially going to screw it up or whether or not government should be involved, even if the gap gets wider. And people are evenly split on that question over and over again. More government action, get the government out of this, even if the gap gets wider. Um, Interestingly, if you look back to the data on Occupy, um, and this goes to the question of the underpinnings of the dream, the underpinnings of the free enterprise system, um, Occupy got a lot of media attention. The pollsters focused intently on it for a very short period of time, and then they turned their attention somewhere else. But when Occupy began criticizing the free enterprise system, opinion turned against Occupy very quickly overall. So there are deep concerns about inequality in the society, um, but they 
don't seem to be um, undercutting a personal sense of optimism among them. So. I was going to suggest that maybe yeah. we give the uh, students priority for yes. questions, and then we'll go to others since we only have these summer fellows and interns for a couple of months a year. If you wouldn't mind stating your name and your affiliation again and wait for the mic. There's two mics in the back. I'll let you call on people, but Good. students, you get first priority. Don't be shy. Thank you for speaking with us today. Um, my name is Andrew Vasciano, um, and I go to Rutgers University, but I'm an intern at the Daily Caller. Um, your talk was very interested and interesting, and I was interested in working at a think tank um, after I graduate college. So I was wondering what your career path was like. What's it like doing research and um, do they even hire people out of college, or do you need like a PhD? Uh, well, we certainly hire people as research assistants, and I can probably speak better for AI, but you could probably say a few words about what Heritage does. We are really excited to get young people who believe in AI philosophy and, and want to come to Washington. We usually say that we'd like you to stay in most departments at AI, but not all departments. But in most of the academic departments, we say we'd like you to stay for two or three years and then go back and do something um, that you want to do in your community, go back and get the advanced degree, go back and go to Harvard Business School, whatever it might be, but that we, we want you to get that experience overall. There's not a lot of upward mobility at AEI. It's very unusual for somebody who starts as a research assistant to move up um, overall. We don't hire at AI. We're unusual in the think tank world. We don't have issue agendas and departments. We simply hire people we think are really talented and are going to and are going to be able to do work, and we give them an enormous amount of free reign. The only thing I'm required to do is write a memo to the president three times a year telling him what I'm working on. Now, he could say to me, Carlin, you know, that's above your pay grade. That's not going to happen. Um, but I can still go ahead and pursue something if I want to do that. Um, but for the most part, um, there's very little hierarchy at AEI. There's very, so it's, I think it's just an extraordinary place to work. I would not be hired at AEI today. I don't have the academic credentials. Um, I started as a very junior research assistant on this small magazine, as I mentioned, called Public Opinion. And um, I sort of worked my way up over time, but I don't think that would happen today. I, some of the people we're bringing in um, you know, have double doctorates already at the scholar level. Um, it's just, I wouldn't be hired. It's just a, a simple fact overall. But, we love to encourage you to come to a place like AEI, work for a couple of years, and then go on to the things that you really want to do. And, and Heritage is probably, I'm sorry, there are some departments at AEI, if you want to make a career out of, let's say, development or communications, there's an enormous amount of upward mobility in those departments overall, but not the academic departments. So, Carolyn? Yes. So I was a 50% of our researchers. Your hand if you're a heritage intern. I'm also a heritage intern. Um, I do have a research assistant as well, but um, you know, I would say um, in regards to actually getting the experience, I would say I'm not as experienced as you are. Um, but I would say that we're um, in many other respects, we like to hire those who have done real work in the field, you know, internships or actually have taken some research assistant um, work in the past that we would like to hire. So I think that's a good point. Yeah. We do um, hire interns. We have something I think it's in commerce that's called pre-hiring. It doesn't mean that you'll guarantee the job, but if you've been an intern and your supervisor really likes you very well, we will we'll say to you something like, "Well, think about applying when you uh, when you finish college overall." And I've tried to persuade several of my interns that they don't want to go back to college, but it's never been successful. <laughs> that they want to just come and work for me, um, but that that doesn't happen very often. That's why it's probably never happened overall. But we're probably different in a number of other ways. Um, AI is still remarkably uh, non-hierarchical in my view. So, and again, um, you know, we look for somebody like a Nick Eberstadt, who's just written a fascinating book about uh, men in the workforce. And you don't see Nick for like weeks at a time at AI. Who knows, you know, whether he's there or whether he's not there. But he turns out these extraordinary pieces of research just because he's he's got that kind of mind. And for many years, um, just to give you another example, we thought the folks at Brookings were doing education really well. So we didn't think we needed anybody working on education. And Paul Peterson was there, shared a lot of our ideas on charter schools and the like. Um, 
Um, but we eventually found the right person to build an education department. So we were looking once again for individual talent and not any kind of issue or policy agenda. So that makes it better. Clear Bill Flutes were much smaller, of course. <laughs> but um, with occasional exceptions, we like you to get a little work experience. And then the most important thing for Claire Booth Flus is that you have been a leader and an activist on your college campus, yeah. that you have stood up and defended conservative ideas so that you can inspire other young women to do more. But again, we're much smaller. We have chapters on college campuses, as you do. You do oh, you do not. You do not. OK, that's something new that we've done in the last couple of years, and that's um, producing a lot of people who want to come to AI. And in addition to our intern program, we have about 60 interns, 60 to 75 interns in the summer. We have. We have two other academic programs that are one-week programs that are um, taught by scholars at AEI for that entire five-day period. And we bring in, I think, 215 people over the course of the summer who were there for that single week to take a course on a very specific topic overall. Um, when Brookings was founded, um, as you, I don't know whether any of you have ever Googled Brookings for a research report, but you probably noticed Brookings has an EDU after its name, and most think tanks are ORG. Brookings was a degree-granting institution for many years, and um, Arthur Brooks at AI has thought about whether or not that's something we might want to do in the future. It's really a big investment if you decide to do something like that. It turns out it's not too hard to get accredited, but it's really hard to put a, a program together. Um, Brooks himself is a, is a, got his PhD at RAND, which is the other big graduate school um, uh, overall in the think tank community. But we think about it on and off, and all these different kinds of internship programs that we have over the course of the year and the summer are all designed to see what it would take to do something like that. And thus far, we haven't pulled the trigger at all because it is such a huge work overall. And there are also so many good academic, uh, you know, Claremont, Pepperdine, a lot of them have summer in Washington, spring in Washington of those things overall, but um, we treat our interns very well, and uh, it's a very nice place to be in the summer. Any of the students have questions? Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Talia Weiss uh, from MIT. Uh, so you, no you noted at one point that Americans tend to hold deeply contradictory views uh, on a number of public policy issues and often retreat from advocacy or other political engagement as a result and used abortion as an example. I wanted to know on, on what other issues you see those sorts of contradictory opinions. Both trade and immigration. Um, on trade, we want to be able to buy cheap shoes at DSW, but at the same time, we want to protect American jobs. Um, and those two issues are in, in some ways in conflict. The Chicago Council on Foreign Relations started asking a question in 1972. Um, and they asked people about the most important foreign policy goals of the United States. And they've asked the identical question every two, four years, something like that. And they asked it again in 2014. So I went back and I looked at all of the rankings of various issues starting in 72. And the top foreign policy issue was protecting American jobs, higher than terrorism, higher than a lot of other issues in various years overall. So that is, that's the one of the ways that Americans conceptualize foreign policy goals. And so people want to protect American jobs, but at the same time, they, they sort of know in their hearts that free trade benefits um, the, the population as a whole. And you also see the same thing on immigration. Um, we believe protecting our borders is important. Um, controlling immigration is important, but at the same time, we think it holds good jobs. Other people want their cake. We think they add to the culture. We have some concerns about that overall. But again, you see these deeply contradictory views when most people pull away from the issue. And in the deeply, and I didn't talk about this all at all, but in the sort of deeply polarized environment that we have, you occasionally see parties switch places on which they emphasize more. And we certainly saw that in 2016 where the Democrats looked more like they were free traders in most of the primaries, and the Republicans looked like the protectionists overall. So again, sometimes you see these underlying currents where the parties are, are changing places, but so many issues today um, are informed by deep partisan politics. Other questions? Um, this one right here. Um, thank you for speaking today. Um, my name is Katie, and I'm a fellow with Claire Booth Loost, and I'm from Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. 
Um, I'm, I, I'm in the Senate at my school, and I'm actually trying to start a survey um, because we haven't had any kind of survey to see what um, political affiliations people are on campus. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the administration just assumes that everyone's liberal, so they should teach liberal ideas. Um, is there any um, advice you have for trying to kind of get a feel of um, what students are without kind of directly, because I feel like if I directly ask them, what's your political affiliation, almost all of them would just say, oh, I'm a Democrat, because that's what they think they are, but a lot of times they aren't. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any advice for, for that? First I'd, first, I'd look at two of the major surveys that have been done on college campuses for many years. Um, one is just an extraordinary rich, extraordinarily rich survey. It's been done gosh, every year since the since 64, it's called the Aspen Study. It's done by UCLA, and you, all of you may have remembered filling out this survey your first or second week of college, where you're asked just hundreds of questions, a very small number on public policy issues, but most of the questions are about what your high school experience was like, what was your mother's highest level of educational attainment, your father's, how you went through the college. It's just an incredibly rich survey in many ways, but they do ask a question on political ideology, and you can. You, you, I would take a look at that over time and just to see, and they ask, for example, um, a few attitudinal questions about things that are going to be important to you when you graduate, and that's that, that particular data is very good. So you might want to replicate some of those kinds of things. I'm sure you could find an academic advisor or maybe sociology or politics who, who might be willing to consider fielding a survey of your campus. It's not an easy thing to do because you have a small, discrete population, and you want to get a high cooperation rate. but ask some of the questions that have been asked on other surveys. The other very good survey um, is done by Harvard and the Institute of Politics, and they look at both young people in college, and, and then they look at 18 to 29-year-olds generally. And it's, it's a very well-designed survey. They do it quarterly, and um, it's, it's very rich because it asks about not just politics, but a lot of other things about things you plan to do or activities you're involved in, religious questions, and that's, that's very good overall, but I, I will help you afterwards and give you some places to look at the questions that you might ask on your own survey. But you ought to be able to do a campus survey. It would be a great project. Maybe you can get credit for it um, with a team of people, maybe with the sociology department, maybe with the political science department, just to, just to see what the views are. And you can try to write questions. It turns out to be something that's very hard to do. My name is Maya Clark. I'm an intern here at Heritage. And I was wondering, uh, sort of following up on this lady's question, uh, talking about the divine a traditional Republican platform. Uh, how would you say that polling indicates how uh, maybe parties are changing, how maybe parties are failing to match the cleavages that divide people, mm -hmm. uh, and what you think the future of the Republican and the Democratic Party platforms will be mm -hmm. in, in these upcoming midterm elections and beyond? Well, publics don't pay a lot of attention to platforms. It turns out neither do candidates. I remember Bob Dole saying he'd never read the Republican um, Party platform at the time of the convention. But that said, the pollsters are always tracking um, a series of issues like which party is better able to handle the economy, which party is better able to handle jobs. We have very, very long historical data on that. I was just looking at the new NBC Wall Street Journal poll that I think came out last week, and I looked at the Republican, the significant advantage Republicans had on handling taxes in the early 19, 1990s, and I've watched that advantage ev evaporate over a long period of time overall, to the point now where those numbers are really dead even in terms of which party is better able to handle the issue. So you do see movement on policy issues by comparing those trends, and the pollsters do a do a great deal about that. I mean, certainly we're seeing the rise of independence driven by your generation overall, the rise of, as I said, you more of you voted for a third party candidate that, um, um, than in any other time, more of the millennial group voted for a third party candidate than has happened before overall. So I think that will continue. Um, I don't see a libertarian candidate doing particularly well going forward overall. Um, um, 
but you see the, the party being nudged in different directions. For example, the exit pollsters in the primaries asked a question that I had never seen before, and it was a question that told us an enormous amount about uh, the 2016 primaries. And they asked whether or not, they asked people voting in the Republican primaries whether they felt betrayed by the Republican Party. That's a pretty strong word. I've never even seen that word in a polling question before. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea who wrote that question. The exit poll consortium is the five networks and the Associated Press, and they duke it out in meetings that have already started about 2020 about whose questions are going to get into the exit poll. And um, in every single state where that question was asked, except one, and I now can't remember the state, more than half said they felt betrayed by the Republican Party. So you knew it was going to be an outsider election when those numbers started coming up early on in state after state after state where there was a spirited Republican contest. And you also saw on the Democratic side, you saw the early support for a lot of the ideas of Bernie Sanders, and you could tell it was going to be a different kind of election very early on. So the, the pollsters, um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens to the exit poll this year. Fox has announced that it's dropping out of the exit poll, as is the Associated Press. Associated Press has stringers all over the country, and they're the ones who sit there next to the Secretary of State's office, and they count the votes, and they provide, you know, the, after that first rating and second rating of the exit polls overall, they give us a sense of what's what the actual results are in a particular state. So I'm not sure what the future of the exit poll is, but um, Republicans and Democrats have some enormous weaknesses right now going forward. Um, Republicans. I remember my colleague Jean Kirkpatrick um, when she w once upon a time the Republican National Committee had this great intellectual journal. This is sort of hard to believe, but they did once upon a time. And Jean was asked to write an essay about why she wouldn't become a Republican. And she said, and I thought this was very important, her first point was, look, party identification is really important. It's deep, it's meaningful, and you stay with your party unless there's a very good reason to leave. But the second reason, and this is still a weakness Republicans have, um, was the so-called compassion issue. She said that Democrats were always first to answer the needs of people who needed help. Democrats were always first to be there for, for people who, who needed assistance. And she talked about the compassion issue, and eventually, obviously, she became a Republican for other reasons. But she was concerned about that weakness, which is still a very powerful weakness for, for Democrats. And, for Republicans and Democrats have a, a different weakness not caring enough about is the group that Stan Greenberg identified, the white working class in the in the 1980 election when he was looking so closely at the at the Reagan Democrats. And so both parties have weaknesses. But interestingly, who asked this question usually in October of every election cycle? And they ask whether or not you're satisfied or dissatisfied with the nominees of the two major parties. And I'm always surprised that in the final analysis, when you get pretty close to election day, when you're doing that poll in late October, most people say they're pretty satisfied with the candidates the major parties have given us. Um, that's not always true, a little more dissatisfaction this year than in other years, but still majority level dissatisfaction. So that, plus the fact that it's really hard to launch a third party, suggests to me that that's going to be very hard. But you know, I'm watching both parties to see what's going to happen. Trump because these are really interesting times. Maybe one more question? Sure. And I'll, I'll stay to answer questions too. So, um, or, I'm sorry. Okay. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, Elle Rogers, Heritage. You mentioned that millennials have this very personalized American dream that's more bound up in family and community than mm -hmm. public policy. And yet their definition of family, it seems, might be a little bit different than the ones that we're used to with yeah. distrust of marriage, support for gay marriage, et cetera. And so do you see this redefinition of family as something that will be ultimately positive in building up civil society, or it, could it be a negative trend? Yeah. Well, they still want to get married, even though they're not married at this stage of their lives. I mean, when you think about it, um, the sort of failure to launch for at least probably 90% of our history, sort of a unified family, everyone living together, was much more common than this, this sort of aberrant period after. 70s, but millennials still want to marry, and they still want to have, by in overwhelming numbers, to have children. So it, we, what we may be seeing right now is a life cycle effect for whatever reasons. But again, a, you know, a lot, a non-significant proportion of, of women are not going to marry and have children, and that has all sorts of implications for the burden. But I actually think the, you know, the family unit, um, 
and um, could be strengthened by some of the things that we have. I, I, this is just for an interesting observation about these very smart young people who come to work at AEI for me. Um, 35 years ago when they came, they, they would say to me, well, I want to be at AEI for a couple of years, uh, but then I'm going to go back to Harvard to get the MPT. They now say, well, I'm going to stay at AI for a couple of years, and I want to go back to Harvard to get the MPT, but then I'm going to Austin or closer to home or Tennessee or Kentucky. And I think that's going to strengthen neighborhoods, strengthen communities, strengthen those bonds that Burke talked about um, overall, um, whereas in 35 years ago, they all wanted to come back to Washington and work, and the sort of boom is off the Washington Rose, and I just see a lot more emphasis on the local. Um, on neighborhoods, on communities, because people don't think Washington can solve problems. We want Washington to do a lot. I know we sort of say about that, but we do. We want Washington to do many things, but at the same time, we are so critical about federal government performance, even on an issue that's as deeply concerning as inequality. We're concerned about government getting involved. Um, but we still have confidence of, about government at the local level, where people, families, and neighborhoods can, can make a difference. I mean, I am concerned about some of the data that people like Robert that they're doing alone and that we're just not joining in the way that we, I think the forms of joining may certainly be different as your generation moves and meetups and all the other kinds of things that, that your generation does that kind of work towards my generation as well. So I think there's positive, um, there are a lot of positive things that can come from that. So. What a great yeah. talk. I could Thank listen you. to her for Thank hours, <laughs> truly. Thank you. But, um, some of our people have to go back after yeah, lunch. Yeah, we have some handouts too. Oh, so, handouts, yeah, and we yeah. have a couple of gifts for you. Oh, good, good, good. Oh, wow. I'm going to have a set of. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have a full our, set. Our limited edition Clairvaux <laughs> Flush Posse. Oh, wonderful. Coffee. And what's your famous saying? What is it again? Okay, okay. No good deed goes unpunished. There you go. It. I love it. And thank and you so much. Our tote bag to thank carry you. all your gifts and thank your you, groceries in. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for thank you so much. Oh, more things. Oh, good. Oh, we thank you all so much for joining us here today. It was really such an interesting talk. We will be follow we will have lunch in Grand Angus, so it's out to the to the lobby to the left. And we will continue the conversation there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.